Hey everyone, welcome back to another lesson. And in this video, we're looking at how to fix glucose spikes between meals. So this is some of our more advanced strategies that we use in practice. And hopefully if you're experiencing this by the end of this video, you'll know exactly what to do to sort this out. Now, in a previous video, we have discussed about the technologies now available to us for type one diabetes care, such as the Dexcom and the Freestyle Libre, which gives us access to much more data points throughout the day, which previously would have been lost, because historically you would have tested your blood glucose levels on a finger pricker only, and that would have been at certain points in the day that you selected, which only gives you the here and now when you do it. it doesn't tell you anything about the direction of travel, which both these technologies do, um, and it also doesn't plot the individual glucose data in between um, those finger pricks, which both these technologies do. So we've got a lot more information to work with. And what we're finding is quite frequently that patients are concerned because they see patterns that resemble a lot like this actually. So between the meals, they're seeing big spikes in their glucose levels, despite the fact the glucose returns to about where they started about four and a half hours later. So this shows us that the dose of insulin they've given is about the right dose. If they gave any more, it's gonna drive the glucose level even lower once the insulin's had its full action, which actually puts them at risk of a hypo if they're running their glucose levels quite tight. Yet for all the will in the world, they can't seem to get on top of these glucose spikes, which is exactly what we're gonna be talking about in this video. So what's causing the spikes? Now, there's a few variables we need to think about here, but more often than not, in fact, probably the biggest variable, in fact, the only variable that's causing it is how quickly the carbohydrate containing food is entering your system and whether or not the insulin can keep up with it. So keep in mind, your rapid insulin takes 30 minutes to enter your system and it takes about an hour to reach its peak. So let's say you've had your breakfast, actually. I've already started drawing this a little bit with the red pen. Let's see if I can find the red pen. Nope, third, fourth time's a charm. There it is. Right. So as you can see, so I've already started here, but I'll just draw it out. So let's say it takes 30 minutes to get in. So you've eaten your meal, you've taken your injection. As you can see, the food's already being absorbed, but the insulin doesn't start getting in till here. And then it's not gonna reach its peak for about an hour. And then it's gonna last four and a half hours. So we can see there's a bit of a mismatch here. All this bit is readily absorbed glucose going into your system unopposed by insulin. So it allows the glucose levels to climb before the insulin's got in. Then later, the insulin takes hold of the glucose and is able to bring it back down. So that's why the dose is correct. You can't do anything about the dose. It's not about increasing the dose. And that's what most people do. They increase the dose and then that sets them up for hypos later, which locks them back into that uh, pattern of chasing their glucose levels because they hypo, they have to treat the hypo, and then they take more insulin to correct the high from the hypo. So what's going on? What, what can we do about this actually? So there's two factors we need to think about. First of all is the type of food that you're having, because certain foods are much more likely to cause this spike than others. So if we just flick back here, you may have heard of this term, it's called the glycemic index. So what the glycemic index is referring to is how quickly those carbohydrate containing foods enter your system. So something that's said to be high glycemic index or high GI as we call it, gets into your body really quickly. Your body doesn't have much trouble digesting it. So you eat it and whoosh, you get all that glucose entering your system at once pretty much, which, gives, uh, which makes it much more likely that you're gonna see a spike in your glucose levels, especially if your insulin's playing catch up. Whereas something that's medium to low glycemic index or GI, it takes a longer period of time to get into your system. So you get less carbohydrate entering your body at any given time. So you're less likely to see a spike. So high glycemic index foods is anything that tends to be quite processed. So anything that's like your white starch, like white bread, white pasta, white rice, highly processed foods, so they're very easily absorbable for your body. And I think that you mash, like mashed potato, you're literally breaking down the starch. It makes it really easy for your body to absorb it. Same with things like juicing. Any orange juice, apple juice, pineapple juice, any juice is very easy for your body to absorb. It's why it's one of our hypo treatments, because it's so easy for your body to absorb it. Same with things like sugary drinks, same principle. 
cereals, although they can be low or medium GI on the pack, the second you add milk to them and soften them up, it becomes really easy for your body to absorb them. Think about it, you barely need to chew cereal once it's moistened, you can almost swallow it whole. And the same thing happens in your gut, it gets straight in, which leaves you prone to high glucose levels. Any tropical fruits and some vegetables are also high glycemic index. Now I've added some stars next to these because there's a caveat with this, which we'll come back to. Whereas the medium to low glycemic index foods, it's kind of the opposite of this. So anything that's wholemeal, seeded, granary, brown starchy foods, brown rice, brown pasta, seeded bread, is medium to low glycemic index. New potatoes, and ironically sweet potatoes, are much lower glycemic index compared to your standard uh, potatoes, baking potatoes. Most fruits are low glycemic index. Things like couscous, quinoa, pearl barley, also lower GI. Oats um, are much lower GI compared to cereal and actually you can take that one step further and have overnight oats. When you put it in the fridge overnight, it binds the starch together. And actually you've probably seen this effect with things like uh, reheated pasta and stuff. When you put pasta in the fridge, it binds together. How often do you like try and get the pasta out of a refrigerated container and it just comes out in a big lump? That's the starch binding together much lower GI. Now I'm not saying you should always eat just reheated uh, pasta to try and control your glucose levels, but you can see the GI effect in practice when you do that. Um, and also most vegetables are low GI as well. And most fruits, as I say. Um, and again, at the bottom here, we have chocolate with some asterisks. So what's the asterisks about? Well, we can take this one step further because what the glycemic index doesn't do is factor in how much carbohydrates in the food. Now obviously we're accounting for the carbohydrates with our insulin dose, but just from experience, if a food is high GI, so it's got a real quick release into your body so the insulin can't necessarily keep up, and there's a lot of carbohydrate there, there's much more potential for a spike compared to something that has low carbohydrate. So we can take this one step further and look at something called the glycemic load or the GL. So this takes the glycemic index and it also factors in how much carbohydrate there is. Now something like chocolate is actually low glyce medium to low glycemic index because it has a lot of fat in it. And fat slows down the absorption of carbohydrates or any food for that matter, which is why we tell you not to eat chocolate to treat hypos because you'll end up in the hypo longer than you need to be because fat slows it down. And that's why actually when you're looking at spikes like this pattern that I originally drew out, more often than not, it will be at breakfast because breakfast is where we eat. Typically speaking, just carby foods, toast, cereal, nothing there to slow it down. Whereas the evening meals or lunch, we tend to pair it with more protein um, and some vegetables and more fiber, which actually acts to slow down the absorption. So if you're gonna get a spike, usually it's at breakfast because that's the most quickly releasing meal of the day if you're eating a conven conventional UK breakfast. So when we actually start to factor in the um, carbohydrate content of foods and the glycemic index, the list starts to look a lot more intuitive to as you would expect. So high GL foods is any of those processed starchy carbohydrates, white bread, white pasta, white rice, they remain here. As does sugary drinks, juice drinks, anything mashed. So that stays the same. But now we can start adding in things like dessert, chocolate, because even though they're high, um, fat, which that means they're not particularly uh, high GI, they're still very sugary and have a lot of carbohydrates. So that compensates for the fact that they're lower, uh, lower GI and puts them into this high glycemic load category. Then we also have a medium column. So things like brown rice, wholemeal, uh, sorry, brown wholemeal starchy food, uh, brown wholemeal granary starchy food, sorry, um, live in here. So this is kind of like your brown rice, brown pasta, seeded bread. Now, obviously these are lower GI, but they still have a lot of carbohydrate. They're still very starchy. Rice has over 80 grams, give or take, maybe 70 some brands um, of carbohydrate per 100 grams. So it's 70 to 80% carbohydrate, which doesn't mean it's unhealthy, but what it does mean is it could be the slowest releasing food in the world, but it still has a lot of carbohydrate and therefore it still has a reasonable hit for the glycemic load, which means there's still potential there if you misjudge your insulin dose to push you high. Same with oats, same with quinoa, pearl barley, couscous, foods like that. But then when we start looking at the low category, you can see we have low to sort of neutral chance of a spike, whereas these ones have a big chance of spike, medium chance of a spike, but most fruits now live in the low glycemic low category. In fact, probably all fruits, 
with the exception probably being dried fruit and maybe some ripe bananas because they are quite carby and very quickly released. But other than that, all the other fruits will live in here. And that's because they have a low carbohydrate content, even if they are quite high GI. So watermelon is a good example. Watermelon's high glycemic index, but there's only about three grams of carbohydrate per 100 grams. So, you know, you're gonna have to eat almost three tons of watermelon before it makes a dent. Three grams per 100 grams of watermelon compared to 80 grams for rice, it's night and day. All vegetables, even though some vegetables are high glycemic index, again, there's so few carbohydrates in them that it's very hard to cause a spike. Even if there is a spike, it's gonna be such a small blip on the radar that you're not gonna notice it. And the same thing for like legumes, beans, pulses, lentils, chickpeas. There's carbs there, but you have to eat quite a lot of them before it becomes significant. But these are also quite slow releasing, so you kind of get a good double whammy here in terms of slow releasing and not a huge amount of carbohydrates. So if you're eating these foods in abundance, you've already got less chance of a spike. You throw in some of these and pair them with more fatty and protein-based meals, um, then actually you're gonna have less chance of a spike compared to these foods. So then if we return back here, when you're seeing these spikes, it generally means that your insulin isn't getting in quick enough to compensate for the food that you're eating. So we can do a couple of things. We can change the food. So if you're someone that's having cereal or white rice or white pasta, then change it to the lower GI version. So rather than cereal, have overnight oats. And if that's not working, have a couple of boiled eggs on some granary toast. The protein and the fat in the eggs will slow down the absorption and granary toast is already a lower GI option. You'll see the curve start to just come off this and it will start to look a bit more favorable. Same with the evening meals. If you're having mashed potato or white rice or white pasta, move to the alternative new potatoes or brown pasta, brown um, rice. And again, it will just take the edge off. But again, these are still very carby, carb uh, carby foods. So you can still get a spike, um, in which case you might just need to lower the carbohydrate content. There's not a great deal of evidence about lower carbohydrate diets in type one diabetes, but anecdotally, from when I see a lot of these graphs with patients, when we move to a lower carb diet, it tends to just take the edge off. So that's the first thing we can do. The second thing we can do is move the timing of the insulin. It takes 30 minutes for the insulin to get in and get going. It takes an hour to, sp to spike. So if we front load that and move the entire insulin dose a bit earlier, so taking it 30 minutes before the meal, then it's starting to work as you're eating. So you've got less chance of a spike. I've heard some patients even tell me they need to take their insulin up to an hour before they eat in order to prevent this from happening. <coughs> now, that's not ideal because that's not the most practical advice. It's the best in terms of what the glucose response they'll get, but we need to weigh the balance, don't we, between practicality or the most practical advice and actually um, the, the best advice in terms of your glucose levels. So we're trying to find a balance. So if you're finding that moving the insulin a bit earlier isn't practical, to be fair at breakfast, we can kind of have that bit of flexibility because you generally know you're gonna eat breakfast. Whereas the other meals of the day, you might get distracted, you might get called away from your desk when you're at work, something might happen at home. But nonetheless, if you can plan the meal and you know you're gonna eat it, then you can kind of be flexible with the timing of the insulin. But if you can't be, then the way to sort this out is change the type of food that you're eating, what you're eating it with in terms of food pairing, more fat, more protein. I'm not saying go on a really high fat diet and start infusing cheese into your veins, but just having a protein and a lean source of, uh, and, and some fat with the meal will help. Vegetables will help, fiber will help. Pairing those foods up will help. Moving to lower GI and GL foods will help. And then if you can move the insulin dose as well to a little bit earlier to give the insulin a chance to get going, that will also take the edge off. So I'd encourage you, give it a go, see what happens. If you have access to the Freestyle Libre or the Dexcom, have a look, see how it translates in reality on your graphs. If you don't, I'm afraid you're gonna have to do it old school and do a two hour post meal test on your glucose levels. Bit few more finger pricks, but it will show you what's happening. Now at the end here, I've drawn just a little rise in your glucose levels. We're gonna be talking about that in another, le in another lesson, um, but just keep in mind for this, the GI effect of food because it will be very relevant, but we'll go back to that when we talk about it. So we'll leave it there and I'll see you at the next lesson, guys.